Oh yeah, a little bit late. Maybe about a couple seconds. But here I'm in. It's Tuesday, 5 p.m. and it is time to do a little break on through with me, your host, Jeffrey K. Clayton, the long-haired weirdo, the unimpeachable president for life. I got started real late. I got some things moving around here. I got to move my clock so I can see. Oh, hell. Everything's going to shit. Hold on, folks. Yeah, shit's falling down all over town. I put Farrah up so you could see her. All right, now, here we go. Now my studio is complete. All right. I just got him down because he fell, so he may fall again. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of break on through now uh, let's see here um i'm starting a new segment on break on through whenever i have things that um i think should be brought to light for people to discuss or laugh about or cry about whichever the case may be uh it's gonna be called here to ruin your groove maybe you remember a record by the same name i told you some bitch would fall god almighty man it's chaos around here i've been uh i've been doing washboards the last few washboards it's not the last one but the last three i've been doing them uh, what the hell else am I? I've been, I've been painting a GG jacket. So, yeah, it looks like... It looks like a damn bomb went off in here, so... Alright, someone just said their packages arrived safe and sound. I can't see who it is because it's already faded into, uh oblivion but i'm glad i'm always glad when packages get to where they're going safe and sound because these days it's kind of hard to to determine but anyway my new segment is here to ruin your groove but before i get uh rolling on here to ruin your groove i want to say a belated happy birthday to my main main marvin haywood i know he's here now um, I wished him happy birthday yesterday via text, but I figured I'd do it here today so that all the people here at Break On Through can wish him one too. Many more, Marvin. Many more. Many more. I know it's going to be backwards, so try to keep it together. Y'all ever heard of this album? That's not an original from, what, 71? Yeah, it's not an original from 70. This is one of the reissues. This gatefold reissue. Pretty nice looking. Got the old poster inside of it that used to come with that record. I mean, I take it everybody watching now is familiar with Black Sabbath. Well... There's, there's something I always wondered about Black Sabbath and Black Sabbath fans. Now I see, I see lots of Black Sabbath T-shirts and patches, and some of the people that are really into this, you know, are like uh, pentagrams, upside down crosses, um, sacrilegious stuff, you know, and like, hey man, hey like, hey man, I'm in the Black Sabbath mon. So. 
Have you ever noticed, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I personally have never seen Black Sabbath live. I've seen, um, I've seen Ozzy so many times I can't remember, you know, solo. I've seen Black Sabbath's best singer, Ronnie James Dio. I've seen him a few times solo as well, but I never got to see, I had tickets to a Mob Rules tour, and uh, I lived 45 minutes east of Charlotte, and then it snowed. It snowed that night, and I, I apparently uh, uh, attendance was tampered, was hampered, in such that they went ahead, they broadcast the concert over um, WROQ radio, the FM station, uh, and I got to listen to it, but I did not get to go because of the snow. <clears throat> But um, look, the the point I'm trying to make here, did, uh, you've all seen pictures of Black Sabbath, either posed photos as a band or on stage. I, I don't know if you ever noticed, but their crosses that they wear are right side up. You ever notice that? I'm going to read a little passage from a a tune, a tune of theirs I really like. Um, now, by reading this, I'm not, um, I'm not giving you my opinion on anything. I'm just, I, I'm putting it out here. I'm telling you the observation I made. We can all pick it apart afterwards, however we would like. Okay. But this is a song called "After Forever." Have you ever thought about your soul? Can it be saved? Or perhaps you think that when you're dead, you just stay in your grave. Is God just a thought within your head, or is it part of you? Or is He part of you? Is Christ just a name that you read in the book when you were at school? I'm going to skip on down a little bit. Could it be you're afraid of what your friends might say if they knew you believe in God above? They should realize before they criticize that God is the only way to love. Like I'm in the Black Sabbath and evil stuff, man. I, I just read. I just read it off the back of the record cover. <clears throat> and I know I mention my friend Janice Blythe on here about every week. I don't know if I've ever outright said that I I do her uh, Facebook page. And I've since started her a Instagram page. It's a fan page, but occasionally Janice will participate on the uh, Facebook page. And uh, uh, if, if you haven't gone and followed or liked, as the case may be, please do. Um, just the other day, I found, I don't know, I, I do searches pretty often looking for her... Um, her film clips and stuff that might be on YouTube. And I've been looking for this one for a long time. Uh, I guess I didn't... Yesterday, I didn't put the uh, apostrophe in soldiers to make possessive tense. Soldiers fortune. I just wrote it. Soldiers fortune. And it came up. The full movie. It's from 1991. The whole movie's on her Facebook page right now. You can watch it. Go ahead. Dan Haggerty's in it. Gil Gerard. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's the last uh, last film she did. Um, and like I've, I've been saying, you know, here we are getting close, very dangerously close 
to the Christmas season, and uh, you know, if you got some some older dudes that you want to get something a little um, out of the ordinary for, or you know, you younger dudes that love your uh, love your horror movies, and you you know where you know stuff came from, you know that. The Hills Have Eyes wasn't made in 2002, or whatever, you know, it was made in 1978. Starred that lady right there. And this is this is one she sent me, so, you know, you can get one. You can get it for gifts, you can get one for yourself. And, as, and one from the aforementioned movie, Soldier's Fortune, she's got... Shoot, man, I don't know, about... Uh, 11... 11 pictures stickers hey if you if you buy somebody a blu-ray of the hills have eyes or incredible melting man you can shoot it out to her for a small fee get her to autograph the case or the paperwork in it pew, right back to you and that's that's a unique gift right there but also, since we're talking about gifts now, you cannot forget about Slam Buddies. <clears throat> now, a bunch of you got them yesterday and today. And I, I, I'm only seeing a few people snapping pictures. Man, y'all got to snap me something. Slam Buddies are doing pretty good, man. If you want these for Christmas, I suggest getting them soon. And um, the second batch of 20 should be here to me this week. So if you're going, hey, man, I hadn't got, I ordered a slam, buddy, and I ain't got it. You're probably in the, the tail end of the first batch of 20 that I had. Now, all those have gone out, but um, I'm still waiting on batch number two. And closely behind it is batch number three. So... Never fear. One day you will say, very soon you will say, my slam buddy is here. And if you are in the Charlotte area, or if you're just a big enough fan that you don't mind taking a road trip, Saturday, December 18th, and I see live at the Tipsy Borough in Charlotte, North Carolina, our annual Christmas show. It's going to be a knockdown, drag out, rock and roll party in the street. Mad Brother Ward has formulated the set list, scientifically tested, to bring you in, bring you up, bring you down. And then slowly bring you back up again for the big power bomb through the table at the very end. Be there. It's free. I know that's a big concern to people. Hey, man, how much does it cost to get in? God damn. It's free. It don't cost anything. And you can get there early enough and get some good food there at the Tipsy Borough. Great Tex-Mex food. We're going to be sitting there eating dinner. Fellowship hour. An hour, an hour and a half before doors. We sit out there and we eat dinner. Y'all come sit near us, beside us. They'll sit at the table with us if there's a chair. <clears throat> That's the way it goes. Can you dig that? Got a couple more things I want to plug real quick, and then I'm going to go on to break on through. Um, on the mark shirts and hats. Stan Hansen, wait till you see what's coming next. But brand new is Stan Hansen, Thin Lizzy, on the mark shirts. Instagram, Facebook, go there. The instructions will tell you how to order if you feel like ordering. You should. Good stuff. They got patches too. Great patches. A uh, real nice big one of the uh, Mid Atlantic um, wrestling logo. That's 
that's the federation we grew up with here. So, um, let me see what else. All right, Christmas record, man. I'm it, stack of that's dwindling down, man. If you want that Christmas record, uh, I'm gonna take what's left to the Tipsy Burrow show. But I don't know, man. If if there's another surge in sales this week, there ain't gonna be none to take to the Tipsy Burrow. Can you dig that? Ah, uh, the hell. I guess I'll go ahead and uh, start break. Whoa, 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 whoa! I got a few more things. Oh, you see that cactus shirt? Yeah, I got this one from a Maine, Maine Mondo Braswell, Japanese version of the wanted dead cactus jack shirt. The back is even more awesome. I, I wish they had a shirt with the back on the front. But, uh, you know, if I felt like getting up, I'd show it to you, but I ain't getting up. Um, let's see, what else we got going on? Oh, yeah. Tomorrow night. Tent. Talks. Tunes. On the Malcolm Tent Facebook page. His shows are always interesting, man. You always learn something on there. He is a well of useless knowledge. And I am impressed by that. I consider myself to be quite a, quite a well of useless knowledge. Um, oh, and every day, every morning on YouTube, Kelly Dean, the Dean of Sods, Adam Wolf. The Morning Report. All your favorite stars endorse The Morning Report. OJC endorses it. Christy Canyon endorses it. How can you go wrong? So listen to every morning. He posts them on his Facebook page, Adam Wolf Facebook page. Listen to that while you're going to work or when you get to work. You don't feel like doing anything... Uh, You know, right, right when you get there. Just listen to it. It's usually not very long. But, uh... All right, so you want... I guess you want to... Well, Jeff Clayton, what are you going to talk about today on Break On Through? What do you... What stories do you have to tell? Well, you know what I'm going to talk about? I got this. This idea came to me via Facebook Messenger from my main, main, Mark Deal. From the great state of Texas. Mark Deal's probably listening to some break on through right now, tattooing somebody. Hell, I don't know. He may be home already. Oh, there he is right there. He's speak of the devil and out he comes. But uh, you know what we're going to talk about today? And, and, and I realize some of the stories you people, you, I may have gone over before on other episodes of Break On Through, but I'm going to talk about it as a um, consolidated um, subject. And that is of the subject of juicing. No? I know some of you are going, damn, Jeff Clayton, what, when did Break On Through turn into a damn uh, uh, Hell's Kitchen where you show us how to make stuff in the kitchen? I mean, I don't, I'm not talking about uh, getting a juicer and making some, uh, making a green bean smoothie or something like that. that. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, most people think I'm, I'm going around, uh, you know, curling up my forehead all the time, but I'm not. I'm, I'm completely relaxed. Well, now I'm raising it up, but now I'm completely relaxed. See all that? See all that relief map? Right there? That's, 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 that's from what is known in the wrestling business 
is juicing. Do I think I'm in the wrestling business? Nah, I know I'm not in the wrestling business. What inspired someone to want to play rock and roll and think that during their live performance, they need to bleed all over the place? Well, that influence for me, anyway, did come from professional wrestling. Abdullah the Butcher. Seeing Ric Flair and Greg Valentine go out in cage matches, watching that blonde hair turn ketchup red. Ivan Koloff in a Russian chain match. This was before all the uh, extreme hardcore. You know, I guess blossomed in Japan, but quickly spread all over the world. That was one uh, aspect of it. The second aspect would have been from other music acts. Well, granted, only a few of these were really bleeding, but the but the uh, the reaction that even the fake blood would get, such as Alice Cooper. Or kiss. Um, and just hearing the stories for the longest time of Iggy Pop. Um, and then when we find the kindred spirit. With anti scene, Gigi Allen, who was taking it to a whole different level than we were. But I can tell you the thing that made me decide, you know what, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna walk that line when it comes to playing live. Joe Young worked at um, the South Park Mall record bar. And uh, one day he brought home one of these trade magazines, a little digest thing about like this. He brought it home, gave it to me, because uh, it had Frank Zappa on the cover. Zappa wearing a bright pink shirt with a big silver glove that had alien fingers on it, and you know, going... You know how Zap always looked. Big mustache. And he said, hey, hey man, I found this uh, this magazine with Zap on the front. Figured you'd, you'd want to see this. I said, all right, thanks. You know, so I'm looking through. I get to the very back page and there's a tiny microscopic picture of the lead singer from Rose Tattoo, Angry Anderson. Mic in hand, busted open right here from a guitar headstock. Blood just going down like this into his mouth and all. And I was like, wow, man, that's, uh, that's quite an image. I think I'm going to make this image. Well, how would I do it? Well, it, uh, it started with smashing a damn microphone into your head. Now, how long do you think a person would be able to continue doing that?
Man, sometimes I damn near about knock myself out. But see, I had a shitty, cheap ass little mic. I didn't know nothing about high quality microphones, man. You know, microphone's a microphone. Plug it in. Yeah! You're there. Alright. Well, what happened was the more I beat this microphone to death, the uh, the screen, you know, the, the mesh part of the of the ball that covers the uh, diaphragm thing, um, it it started splintering, breaking. So it had little shards of metal all over. It got to eventually where I could just go, ah, like that, and <clears throat> there it happened. Hmm. But then eventually, um, one one time, come quite by accident. Uh, you you guys have heard me mention the Yellow Rose. It's a local nightclub that we used to play. The place that let us play when everybody else in three states had said anti sing will not play here anymore because of the mess we made. The um, the smoke residue that took quite a while to get out of their clubs, maybe set off alarms. Um, for the reaction we would cause in some audience members. For the way we dealt with audience members that wanted to step out of line. Man, like it. We don't want none of that in our establishment. The Yellow Rose, Dave and B. Malden ran that joint, and they let us, they said, man, do whatever you want to do, what feels good to you there, hoss. And we did. One particular night, I had a glass bottle of Gatorade on stage, and I was I had no intentions to do anything with it other than drink it and um and we got particularly rowdy and things got knocked over man amps used to get knocked you know like if you had amps on chairs or whatever they get knocked over the whole chair and everything get knocked over stomping all over shit man my, my bottle um it got I, I don't know if I purposely broke it or if I accidentally broke it with the one of those heavy microphone uh, stand bases. But uh, all I know is there's glass and Gatorade all over the floor. And I found the damn uh, nozzle to it still had the cap. And it made a big shard doing like a talon. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, no, I just, I just do a little cut. Get a little bit of good old juice going. Get a rise out of the punchers. I got a rise out of the punchers, all right. Uh, motherfuckers thought I was going to fucking die. I cut in so deep and so hard and a flap of skin, man. Blood was everywhere. You could smell it. That's how much it was all over, you know, the wooden stage. So it's in the stage, man, and I lay, and, and like, I got so dizzy from the rapid blood loss, I, I just collapsed onto the stage. I'm laying there, man. And I remember Joe Young holding his, uh, he, back then he played a Fender Bullet. This was before, um, the, um, the Telecaster became his weapon of choice. You're right, Ryan Minton. It, it, it smells like pennies. Like if you got a handful of pennies in, like yeah, ugh. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what blood all over the place smells like. But um, he leans over to me, he hit a chord, you know, letting the song ring out, bang, feeding back. He leans over to me and says, "Man, are you gonna play?" <coughs> Or are you going to die? So I was like, 
Man, don't nobody ask me if I'm going to die. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to play. I played. I don't remember much of it. But then, you know, as time went on, I, I um, tweaked my craft and I knew how to you know, pull back and make the desired effect. But there are, there are many times in our almost 40 year history that it, it got, um, it got to be too much. Now, are we still on? The phone said that it was trying to connect. Okay, I see thumbs up. I guess we're still going. Okay. But, um, So yeah, a few times, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to go and tell each individual thing, but man, I, it got to where, and, and it was our fault. It was my fault entirely that uh, eventually, <clears throat> that's all people came to see us for. So, of course... I took a little exception to that, and uh, I had a policy that if anybody asked me, hey, are you going to bleed tonight? Then I would purposely not. Well, Yeah, the barbed wire didn't come into the shows till much later, but uh, yeah, barbed wire hurts. <laughs> Especially when you got a long, beautiful mane like I've got. Mm. But the the most pain I ever felt in one of those barbed wire shows was a one of the barbs stuck into my pinky finger right there like right under the nail and ripped up and I had a, a scar that just went straight up and it broke my nail that hurt like a son of a bitch you know I had scars all over my arms my head my face you know when it got through my clothes I had little stick holes all in me that was fine but that pinky thing Man, I didn't think I was going to survive that. But, uh, but then, you know, it, it got to where, um, I feel, now you may feel different. People listening to me that really maybe don't like us may not agree. I, I can't believe anyone that don't like us would sit and listen to this, but I'm sure, I'm sure they do. Um, because they, Pick it apart. But, um, they pick it apart and go, I should get the credit for that. I did that. <laughs> a lot of that going around. But anyway, um, I, I felt like as time went on, we were able to be just as exciting of a band by simply playing our songs than having to count on that all the time. Um, I've done it less and less over the last few years and I gotta tell you that comes from and I mean that I do not mean this in a derogatory way But, um, what, part of the reason there was the slack up on that was because of the imitators. And I do not mean that in a, um, in a negative way toward any of you that may have imitated what you saw when you saw us or Gigi. 
but uh, for instance, we would share the stage with uh, a group called Eat the Turnbuckle. Excitement at its greatest. But when you come on stage after six guys just bled like stuck pigs all over the place, doing a little bit right here is kind of redundant. You know, it's like, sorry, Hoss, um, impact not accepted. Now, you know, the guys from Eat the Turnbuckle told me the reason they formed the band was so they could open for us at a show we were getting ready to do in uh, Philadelphia. And see, I consider that a compliment. Because a, a band that has that outrageous of a stage show and is uh, that exciting to watch and they were inspired by something we did and you know maybe even just a small amount it, to me that's a compliment and uh, I'm not going to sit down and go down the list of names and all but I mean the only thing the only thing that really kind of irritated me about it was when we would play with these groups. And they would, um, they would do it before we went on. And I'm just like, now, I, I had an analogy of that that I would talk to, that I have laid on these guys. Cause man, believe me, a lot of them were very respectful and asked, is it okay? You know, we like, and if, and if I felt like, man, I just don't feel like I'm going to reach that, that zenith tonight. I said, yeah, man, go ahead and do it. You know, whatever. But otherwise, I would just like to leave that option open so that by the time we come on, it's not old news and everybody hadn't seen it for the last hour and a half. So, but, but, but the analogy I would use is like, man, if, if you're booking a wrestling show, right, and your main event is Ric Flair versus whoever, well, you know how that's going to end. <clears throat> Ric Flair's going to get them in figure four, and they're more than likely going to uh, submit, or get them in the figure four, wear them down and roll them up, pin, 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 bam, Flair's the winner. That's that's the showstopper. That's the way you want to end your show. So you don't need a couple jobbers going out there on the opening match and um, doing a figure four. That's Flair's move, man. That you, you don't do that. I mean, you might think, well, well I'm better at the damn figure four. I don't care if you're better or if you think you've done a different spin on it. You, you demonstrate that when you're not on a card with Ric Flair, who uses that as his finisher. You understand what I mean? I hope you understand. But, I mean, I don't own the patent on it either. It's not like uh, when you do that, I, you know, uh, I'm going to have some copyright cops come by and, you know, try to collect some... I wonder if I can do that. Um, I'm not going to do that. But, uh, um, I don't know. Just, um, I mean, you know, a lot of other guys were doing it unaware of what we were doing, like Jerry A. The Poison Idea. So, um, yeah. Man, the, the, the one quick jab at wrestling that I did take, and I've talked about this before, but I'll, I will, um, I'll just 
nutshell this thing for you. I, I was a wrestling manager called Rip Carnage. I wore my big shiny rebel flag robe based on the Freebirds, made for me by the exotic Adrian Street. I would wear that, and um, and I was uh, managing uh, the guy that was training me to wrestle, uh, Mad Dog David Lynch. And I remember one match in particular at Kings Mountain, North Carolina, at the Armory. Um, we were the opening match, and it was a gimmick match to open the thing. I, I mean, I didn't think that was right, um, but... I'm not booking the damn thing, so I, I ain't got a dog in this fight, man. That they asked me to be on it with dogs, so I'm I'm grateful. I ain't going there to tell them how to run their run their show, you know. But um, gimmick match, uh, Indian strap match, and I used to carry around this uh, chrome femur bone, a human femur bone made of uh, chrome. No, you know, it's chrome plated. It's made of metal, heavy, and um, it was me and it was Mad Dog David Lynch versus Chief J Eagle, and I'm of course you know doing all kind of dastardly things to help cheat and help Dog win, which we failed miserably at that. But um, we had it in the storyline that Chief J Eagle would take the bone away from me and hit me in the head with it and I'd open up, you know, first match. So, uh, I got a little bit carried away that time. Man, there was blood everywhere. And, uh, and I, I think I was, I think I was selling it pretty good being injured. You know, I'm getting up, falling down, you know, acting like I can't, get my bearings and all this. People are kicking me when I go by. And then one of the guys at the uh, announce table say, said, Rip, hey, man, get back to the um, the dressing room. I was like, no, man, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, man, they want you back in the dressing room. You're scaring all the kids and the old folks. I was like, oh, okay. So I make my way back to the dressing room. And, of course, the crowd's laughing at me, throwing stuff at me. And, uh, you know, and I just go back in there and sit. Man, I get cleaned up, and, I, and I'll and i never forget this. I don't know if he remembers this, but George South, who is, only, who is also a notorious bleeder, was sitting across the dressing room at me, from me, and he was taping up and stuff, and I just remember him looking at me and kind of smiling, not smiling like, you stupid, you know. He was smiling at me like, <laughs> That's the way you do it there, cowboy. But, you know, we have, he and I have talked about that time uh, since. And, uh, yeah, it was a respect thing. I, I felt like I was in their territory, you know, and uh, kind of stomping all over their thing. And I remember uh, some of the aforementioned children that were scared during the match, uh, One of the mothers brought the, the kid around. You know, they had a concession stand that was kind of connected. There was a kitchen in between what was our dressing room and their concession stand. And so uh, this woman brought her kid there. I can't remember if it was a little boy or a little girl. But she wanted me and uh, Mad Dog to talk to him and you know, ease their mind, hey, you know, we're just, we're just, we're just, we're just. and they're like, uh, Rip, will you go over there and, uh, and talk to that kid, and I'm just like, no, I just walked by the kid, kind of gave him the side eye, like, you know, they were afraid, they believed every bit of it, I wanted them to be afraid, the dog went and talked to him, and you know, and all that, but not me, I, I wouldn't do it, and because of that, I had, they they made us stay in the dressing room until the entire thing was over. They said, man, y'all can't go out there now. 
and get in your car and go because you may have some people follow you out there. And so we're like, damn. I mean, that was not our intention. But you know what? The fact that we were able to bring that opening match, <clears throat> I was very proud. I got a lot of feathers in my cap. I probably got so many feathers in my cap. I look like Wahoo McDaniel when I put that cap on. But uh, that's one of the feathers in that cap. Didn't do that. And I thank David Lynch, Scotty McKeever, rest in peace, Scotty Hot Body, even the Flaming Youth. He was part of that group. Dozer, who put on the damn show and had me be part of it. George South, Wahoo McDaniel, all those guys that. Welcome to be in the dressing room and didn't uh, treat me like a uh, intruder. Thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up here in about five minutes. Anybody got any quick questions? I'll try to answer them if I can see the damn question. But. Um, I guess in, in closing, I'll just say um, thank you for joining me for another Tuesday. We're clocking in a little over a year now. Shit. Yeah. We're, we're getting close to two, I think. I had to talk to Malcolm Tent. Malcolm Tent is the archivist. How did you come up with the name Rip Carnage. Man, I if, if I'm not mistaken, I think that is something that me and the Dean of Sods came up with. Man, I, I don't know if people realize how far back the connection with me and Kelly, Kelly Dean, KD, goes. I mean, uh, so much stuff that Anti-Scene put out was a result of ha just hanging out with and having conversations with him. Matter of fact, the entire concept of Here to Ruin Your Groove was from a conversation with us. So, all right. Well, I've gone uh, this whole episode and didn't break out into song. I, maybe some of you are disappointed. Goodbye, I hope we meet again, goodbye, why did it have to end, a little free there for you, I probably make, missed the lyrics up, but hey, I didn't practice, let me see, I'm getting some questions now. Uh, am, am I a fan of uh, Black Sabbath with Tony Martin? Yeah, I thought that stuff was good, man. I mean, it, there's not a bad Black Sabbath period, is there? There's just some that are better than others. And when I say Dio is my favorite, people go, oh, you don't like Ozzy! And I love Ozzy albums. I love the Ozzy Black Sabbath records. I love them. Mob Rules, Heaven and Hell. I don't put Dehumanizer in that group. I'm, I'm just talking about them two right there. Favorites. Um, Self-titled. Paranoid Volume 4. Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. Master of Reality. Right there. That's my scale. Did y'all like my Eagles post? <laughs> uh I do like the Eagles. I always have. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have guilty pleasures. Meaning I'm guilty for liking something. I, I don't do that. I ain't guilty for liking nothing. I like. Can you dig it? Well, thanks for coming. And I will see you next Tuesday here on Break On Through. It's what you do. Not everybody.